Um, all right, so before we continue, I quickly wanted to give some references. Um, so if you're interested in some of these things, some, some that are more specific, um, then just feel free to ask me anytime um, or later on, I, I can send papers and so on. Some of the things are relatively new, so there are not that many sort of broad overview, like reviews and things, um, but there's some. So there's one, um, one review article um, specifically for jet physics um, that you can see here um, that that's I think mostly focused on, on the theory. There's a sort of companion paper that's on the experimental side. It's, it's a couple of years now, but it's still a very good reference. Um, sort of the more general jet physics topics, um, if you just Google, there are some uh, PhD level lectures from Gavin Salam, um, who is of course one of the founders of, of, of jet physics. So there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Um, then I'll cover some calculations in perturbative QCD um, that we need to actually compare to the experiment, right? I already mentioned where the is small, so one of the uh, QCD calculations uh, using, say, QCD factorization. Um, two sort of introductory level things is this, um, uh, this one here by, by George Sturman and the TASI lectures from 1995. Um, you can find that here on, on the archive. Um, there's another one here um, that's very nice from um, Dave Soper, where he covers um, things like uh, collisions in the plus and minus collisions uh, in particular, uh, then you can, you know, I think like fragmentation functions and, and how to do some of the calculations really in, in quite some detail that's covered here. Um, so I've you know, taken stuff from all these things. Um, there's also this framework of soft collinear effective theory. Um, so I will not discuss that. So I will be using that, um, but I'll use it in a way that probably you don't even notice that I'm not using directly total QCD, sort of the more traditional methods, but I'm using the effective field theory framework. Um, there's some subtleties to this, um, but so you might not even notice. But if, if, you're, if you're interested in, in learning about this, um, <clears throat> which at least for me is kind of a convenient way to think about perturbative calculations, um, but, but mostly just because I'm used to that, um, is there's some lecture notes by Christian Bauer, Ian Stewart, um, they're online lecture notes if you just Google them. And there are also videos um, that you can find, I think, from, from Ian Stewart's uh, lectures. Um, and there's a second, um, which is maybe a little easier for the introduction um, by Becher, um, Broccio, and Veroglia. Uh, here's the archive number. So that covers a lot of um, sort of very introductory level perturbative calculations. And um, I think they also focus quite a bit on jet physics, um, mostly just because it, well, at the, partly because it's very relevant, but also it, it's a very nice use case um, sort of for soft and effective theory. Um, and so that's, that's really a very nice introductory level um, uh, uh, notes here. Um, so that's sort of very roughly a, a couple of very broad overview things. Um, but for any specific topic, of course, um, I might have some references on the slides, but, but if they're not helpful, um, or if you can't find it, just just um, just let me know. Okay, so <clears throat> so what I want to cover here in this first part now is how do we really exactly define what we mean by a jet? And, and um, I already mentioned that ideally you want to have this idea that that a jet basically captures all the radiation that's coming from a um, high energy uh, quark or gluon or parton or you know, any particle um, that we cannot observe directly, and then instead what we do is we you know, we capture all the, the radiation that this parton emitted into a cone, and then, you know, that will give us a very good proxy for where uh, the parton actually was. Um, and so what we need is basically an algorithm that tells us how to find these cones that you saw on the previous slides. So um, what is illustrated here is what a jet algorithm should do for us, sort of at different levels. So ideally, what we'd like to have is just this sort of simple picture, right? We start with say in this case a QQ bar pair, my right? data say produced in E plus and minus collisions, or say we produce a um, quark anti quark um, at the LHC, it's just a pair. And then what the jet algorithm should do is it should draw cones around these two um, partons, right? So that's sort of the simplest perturbative calculation that we can do, right? We write down the simplest Feynman diagram. That means we write down in this case just a QQ bar pair, and then the jet algorithm should identify that as two separate jets. And 
That's something we can, of course, do on the theory side, but of course we can't do it in practice. So in practice, um, we'll have uh, additional emissions. Right? So this is a leading order picture. The second most naive thing we can do is we can consider one additional emission out of um, um, coming basically from that um, QQ bar sort of dipole uh, uh, structure. And so in this case, we emit a gluon that's relatively collinear to one of the, uh, one of the quarks here. And so of course, what the JET algorithm should do is it should cluster or group this gluon together with the quark over here and basically return the same jets, right? So um, in this case, so here, that's the case of no emissions at all, right? Here's the case of one emission. And so what the JET algorithm should do is it should group those two particles together so that it again looks like this leading order structure on the left, okay? So that's, that's, that's the idea, right? That it should basically undo all these additional higher order QCD effects, right? That so when I draw a cone around this, right, I basically add the momenta of these two particles, I again recover the situation here on the left, okay? And so if I can do that, if I can do that, you know, sufficiently well, um, then indeed the jet that I find, the one that I found, found here is jet one, really corresponds again to this parton level, uh, the quark jet that I found in this leading order picture. Now, of course, that's also not everything. It gets even more complicated, right? We, we have not just one emission at NLO, but we'll have basically a whole lot of emissions, right, that happen. Um, and so that's, well, it's referred to here as, as parton shower, right? Like, like what we often do are like fixed order calculations at next leading order, next to next leading order. But of course, in general, we have contributions in all orders, right, that we have to account for. And so <clears throat> pictorially, what that means is that we have these additional emissions here coming off of those two legs. And again, what the algorithm should do is it should associate these two gluons that come from here with that. Um, so it's like three partons in this case, right? It should group these three partons into a single jet and it should group those four partons into a single jet, right? So that again, after applying a jet algorithm, we again recover um, the structure here of two jets and the two jets that we identify again, correspond to this leading order picture over here. And then of course, we don't actually have quarks and gluons um, that we observe in the detectors, but we'll find protons, pions, kaons, and, and whatnot, right? So we have, of course, there's a transition here from parton quark and gluon level to uh, the hadron level here on the right. And so again, here, what the algorithm should do is it should group those actual particles, not quarks and gluons together and the ones here on the right. And it should again give us, you know, jets one and two. And if we can do that, <clears throat> now really at particle level, um, then we basically have a successful jet algorithm because what it means is even though these are just um, you know, particles, the way we find them in experiment, there's a very close correspondence to this leading order picture over here. And um, we can basically make this identification right that we'd like to make, which is that one jet equals one parton. Um, and so if we define a good algorithm, right, it should be insensitive um, to all these things that happen here and it should always recover here this leading order uh, picture uh, where I basically just have uh, one uh, you know, hard, uh, in this case, quark that I want to recover. So that's, that's basically the main idea of how we should set up uh, a jet algorithm. <laughs> um, all right, so let's take a look at one of the algorithms um, that's relatively um, simple um, that I already mentioned earlier, which is the, the algorithm um, from George Sturman and, and Steve Weinberg from uh, the 70s. And as I mentioned, that's really the first algorithm um, how uh, you know people constructed um, jets, and, and you know they were able to do a calculation. So I should mention this works very well for E plus and minus collisions. Um, at the LHC, we'll use a different algorithm, and we also use we'll use a somewhat different concept of what we're going to call a jet. Right, as you saw before, we had these jets that had these events that have like ten jets. Right, so we need something that works that can you know tell us when there are ten jets. Um, what they did is what is called an exclusive jet algorithm. Um, exclusive means that we want to have events that have specifically two jets, right? And so as you can already imagine, right, that, that will not work so well for the LHC and also not for RIC or, or, or um, DIC. In, in some cases it, it, it does work. Um, and as I mentioned, people work on this still, uh, but it's particularly well suited for uh, E plus E minus collisions. And so, um, what do you see here? So we have incoming E plus and minus pair, and then we produce a, a bunch of partons or, or particles in the final state. And then we group them specifically into two jets. And so the way they define it is that they say, 
uh, an event has two jets if at least a fraction one minus epsilon of the total event energy is contained in the two cones of opening angle delta. Um, so what that means in this particular um, configuration, we have um, these cones drawn around the dominant flow of energy and they have an opening angle delta. Um, and then the additional radiation that's also in the event, so that would be part of particles one, two, and three. So anything that's not contained um, in these two jets, that has to be less, their energy, you know, when you sum it up together, it has to be less um, than a small um, value epsilon of the total energy that's available. So here E uh, is basically uh, the, the center of mass energy um, of the plus and minus collision. So the, the, or the square root of the center of mass energy is a square root of S um, or a Q as sort of the, the energy. And so um, what they basically require is that all um, <coughs> the, the additional energy that's in the event that's not in the jets has to be sufficiently small. And so if that's the case, then you call that a two jet event. And um, that's of course very specific. It specifically asks for two jets, right? That's it, that's what makes it an exclusive jet algorithm, where we have specifically two jets and not three or four or more or, or no jets at all, right? So we specifically ask for a very specific uh, event configuration that looks basically two jet like, right? And you could extend that, for example, in a way to say, you know, what does it look like for three jets, right? So you basically count n jets. Um, or if you know, there are other algorithms that do that, where you basically count how many jets do you find, and so it's an exclusive n jet algorithm with you know, a particular number of jets. And so, well, as I mentioned, it's, it's called exclusive, or at the NHC, we often measure inclusive algorithms. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about that difference later on. Um, and what it makes it exclusive is that we basically put a constraint on all the out of jet radiation. So we, we require that um, the additional radiation that we still have in the event besides the jets is very small. And so that's very different to what I'll talk about later, which is an inclusive algorithm. Like inclusive algorithm basically just means I, I, I identify a jet and then I don't really care about what else happens in the event, right? So I don't basically enforce a global topology on the event, but I just, you know, there is a jet, I'll measure that jet and I don't care about anything else, right? That would be, and I do that for all the jets I find. Say if I find, you know, two jets or three jets, then I'll measure all of those. And I don't care what else happens in the event. But exclusive means I basically enforce a particular configuration um, on the event. And then um, what they can do with that algorithm is they can um, measure and compute the two jet rate. So how often does my event in the plus or minus collision look two jet like? Right. So we only count the events when this particular requirement is satisfied. Okay, and that's something we can measure and we can also compute that. And so uh, what I wanna show here um, and also some little bit more detail is a calculation that they did back then. Um, that was really the first jet calculation um, that, that we have. And it, it was really kind of instructive and uh, you know, later calculations um, that we'll look at um, really kind of do the same thing. Um, so I, 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 I suppose these kind of things were covered a little bit in, in, uh, in the earlier weeks, um, we're not going to do a detailed calculation here with like dimensional regularization um, because we want to do say the next leading order calculation. We'll cover that a little bit later on, um, but I just want to give sort of a little bit of an intuition of, of, of what is happening. Okay, so if we want to do a calculation at least up to next leading order, we'll have to consider um, these diagrams shown over here on the left. So we have a leading order diagram over here where we have the incoming E plus A minus pair and we have a QQ bar outgoing state. In that case, it's kind of trivial because we'll just draw a cone around both of these, right? And there's no additional particles. Um, so that's that's that simple. That of course immediately satisfies the two criteria, right? All the additional radiation outside because there's none is less than epsilon, and it's contained with a cone of delta, right? So that's fine. So then at next reading order, we have to consider these emissions um, uh, here. One of them is a virtual correction shown here on the right, and then we have two real corrections that we have to um, account for. And so the virtual is also relatively simple, or well, at least in terms of the, the jet uh, uh, algorithm, because it's again like this virtual correction, but in the end, it's really just one part on here. Um, so similar to leading order, that's trivially contained, uh, but it's trivially a two jet event. But here now we have to be more careful. So if you look at um, these two configurations here, where we produce um, or you know, calculate an additional 
uh, a gluon in the final state, then that gluon can be inside the jet or it can be outside the jet. And so we can think about this different ways. Now there will be a, a constraint both on the angle of the gluon relative to these jets and on its energy or a sort of a combined requirement. So for example, if the gluon is contained in the jet, so it's basically if it's within distance delta, then I don't really have any requirement on its energy. Right? Um, then it can be whatever energy it wants because it will be clustered together. But if it's outside, then these, um, the Sturman Weinberg um, jet definition requires that this additional gluon has energy less than epsilon. Right? And so I basically have to then account that for that in the theory calculation. So one way to think about this is if this additional gluon that is emitted here, if it's like anywhere in the, in the event, <coughs> sorry. So if it's, um, if it's, or we, so now I, I stated it in terms of like where it is, but we can also think of it in terms of energy. So if the energy of the gluon is less than epsilon, then it can be anywhere in the event, inside or outside the two jets. Um, but only if it's inside the cone, it can have energy larger than epsilon. So that's other way of stating the same thing. And so then what they showed in this paper from 1977, if they do this next to the order calculation, um, then they get this result um, shown here, okay? And so I quickly wanted to show how, at least some steps, how, how we actually get that. Um, so we can look again at these different contributions. We have the virtual um, contribution, we have the real contribution. Um, they come with different sign because there will be singularities. Um, that appear uh, at the intermediate steps of the calculation. But then if we sum up everything together, um, these divergences have to cancel. And so um, that's why the virtual basically comes here with an overall minus sign and the real corrections come with a plus sign. And so, <clears throat> okay, so in general, we will have a prefactor. So we have a leading order cross section sigma naught um, that also appears for leading order. So this is a correction to it. Um, might have, maybe should have mentioned that here, right? So the total cross section for two jets is given by the leading order part. And then um, this is an next to leading order correction. And then the even higher order terms here that are proportional alpha S squared or higher order. Um, and they uh, will, um, uh, well, they're more complicated to calculate. But so here we just want to do an next to leading order. Okay, so um, generally we have to then integrate over uh, the phase space of the additional um, radiated gluon. And if it's virtual correction, there's really no constraint on the kinematics of that gluon. So we're measuring here or we're integrating over the energy of the gluon, K naught. Um, that can be anywhere between zero and um, Q, which is just the center of mass energy. So it's the highest energy allowed. And then we integrate it over all um, the angles. So this is a, an integral over the angle of the gluon relative um, to the QQ bar direction. And also here we integrate over all allowed values from zero to pi. So that's the virtual contribution. Then we have these two real contributions. So here we have to now pay attention to how uh, the jet algorithm actually works. And so in this case, again, it comes proportional to the same um, a prefactor, right? Because it's leading order times a one loop emission that comes just from this vertex here as a color factor uh, in alpha S. Then now here in this case, the energy of the additional gluon <clears throat> can, if it's like really anywhere in the event, right, that's shown here. Um, so if the angle is anywhere between zero and pi, then um, the energy can only be at most epsilon times Q, right? So I basically um, limit here my integral of the energy um, to this upper value epsilon times Q. Right? Um, so that's one case, right? If this is basically anywhere in the event, and then if it's inside, I can have also the contribution um, when the energy is larger than epsilon. So that's shown here. Um, so now I have basically an integral of the energy from epsilon times Q to Q, right? So that's only allowed now when the gluon is within the two jet, one of the two jet cones. And so that's um, basically encoded here on the right side. So um, the angular integral can now only go from zero to delta or from pi to pi minus delta, right? So if the gluon is either in this jet or in this jet on the opposite side. Okay, and so that's basically the contributions we have at next leading order. So we have virtual correction and a real correction. And of course, um, all of those are individually divergent, right? If I consider here, for example, the virtual correction um, uh, and I basically want to integrate that down to zero, right? Then I have a problem here because it's a one over 
uh, k-naught um, uh, uh, divergence, and the same appears um, for uh, the um, uh, for the integral over the angle theta, right? If I evaluate one over one minus cosine squared theta um, at zero, or if I evaluate it at pi, I will always get divergences. Okay. So each individual contribution here is definitely divergent. Um, and so I, I, I guess that was, I covered a little bit, right? If I do perturbative calculations order by order and you know, perturbation theory, then every individual Feynman diagram I try to compute, it will always be divergent. And so only if I ask basically the right question, then um, all these divergences will eventually cancel once I add up all these different contributions. And if I have intermediate steps, right, to actually get the final result from, 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 from George and, and Steve Weinberg, right, then I have to work with a regulator, with an intermediate regulator that actually makes sure that these contributions here are finite. And then only after adding up everything, I can then remove the regulator afterwards. Right. And so I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, here. Uh, the original paper um, did that by basically introducing a finite um, gluon mass. Um, that's not really a very typical regulator that you know I would use today, um, and it works fine at NLO. It can have some issues at higher order, but as it turns out, if you sum up all these different things, you use a regulator for the intermediate steps, um, then in the end you find that you actually get a finite. Um, contribution. And so that's shown here. So if we sum up all these terms here, so the leading order plus all the different contributions at next leading order, then we get the following result for E plus E minus uh, to two jets, so two jet rate, which is again the leading order um, contribution um, times one, and then minus um, alpha S, this is a one loop calculation, and then times, um, you know, this factor here uh, on the right. Yes. What kind of solo do you find if you like an NLO with a finite gluon? I, I think so. At NLO, I think it breaks gauge invariance. So I think okay. you, you'll have issues once you have a triple gluon vertex. Um, but you don't have that here, right? It's just uh -huh. you know four gluon vertices, and so it's fine. But at one or higher, you'd have an issue. Um, right. So you yeah, you can do it just with dimensional regularization uh, as but in well. NLO, then you have to so you only keep it finite at the intermediate stages okay right and then and the final result it will drop out and if you can you start to solo, if, if at higher order yes okay. right right so this this works fine here at, at you know that order and for that particular process but for example if you have pp scattering right then you already have blue on blue on two blue on to two blue on scattering right at leading order and then the one loop correction will already include a three blue on vertex Mm -hmm. So then you would already have a problem at NLO. So it really just works here. Okay. Right, right. Um, well, and, you know, maybe it works in a few other cases, but like it's, 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 it's not like the typical regulator you, you use, right? right. Um, but that's what they use in the original paper. So, um, you know, in, and it's, it's when the paper is very nice to read and they have, you know, all the details of the calculation. Um, so, so that's why I thought it's you know, useful to mention, but it's, it's normally you use dimensional regularization. Um, also, if you want to go to higher order and so on, then, then you would do that. Right, right. Thanks. Um, okay, so then, well, there was the full result is shown here, right? Um, <clears throat> so the, the question is, what, what does it mean now, right? It has, it has some, some dependence, right? There are a couple of logs in there, um, some constant factors here, right? And then there's a double logarithmic term here, um, a log in epsilon and a delta. Uh, here's um, the log two is not really a log in any kinematic variable, but so here we have single logarithmic terms um, just in delta. Right? So we have a double logarithmic term and we have single logarithmic term and then some constants. Right? That, that's, that's the result. Um, <clears throat> so before we think about that result more, um, just in terms of the interpretation, if alpha s is sufficiently small, right? so what, what, what I can do is I can take the ratio of um, the next leading order um, uh, cross section of e plus e minus to two jets, and I can divide out the total e plus e minus cross section. Right? That's also something I can calculate, um, which is actually simpler than this. Right? Um, so that's basically just a total cross section. And then what you find is actually that this ratio here um, is very close to one. So if alpha s is sufficiently small, right, if it's sufficiently high energies, 
then the ratio here is actually very close to one. And that means that if we're at high energies, of course, we have to like quantify what exactly high energy means, but if at high energies, then that dijet event or that, that configuration basically dominates. Um, and that's basically because this ratio here is very close to one. And that means if I'm at high energies, I'm dominated by this leading order process, my, where I have a QQ bar pair in the final state that produces two jets. And I can cover those, I can, you know, identify these two jets with that particular algorithm, and that's going to dominate everything, right? It is going to dominate over basically spherically symmetric distributions, right? It's very unlikely that they happen. And it's also much less likely that I have a, a three or a four jet event, right? If I really want to have a third or a fourth jet, I need to have a hard emission that really produces um, enough energy outside these two cones, right? Then I would not count that. Right? And that's, of course, down by additional powers in alpha s, right? So <clears throat> what it means is that if we're at high energies, any plus and minus collisions, then using this jet algorithm, we find that the two jet rate dominates um, over everything else. Um, and using this jet algorithm, we can actually recover that. And we can recover it. What we're basically recovering is the leading order scattering process, right? Normally, we'll get out a lot of particles. But by measuring these jets, we basically would find that indeed the leading order process dominates, and we can um, we can recover that leading order process by using that particular jet algorithm. Does that kind of make sense? Are there any any questions about this so far? I think someone. Uh, yeah, please, please, please just go ahead and, and ask. Uh, uh, just an easy question. Can you say one more time what the delta uh, represents? Oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure, thanks. So the, the delta here is the opening angle um, of these these uh, these cones. So it's basically the distance. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about you know how normally you, you set up cone algorithms, but it's really just the opening angle. Maybe that should be a two delta here. So it's it's basically um, yeah, I, I may have missed a two here. So it's uh, okay. Yeah, that's know. that's yeah, that's my follow-up question. So that's the the half opening angle then from yes, from yes, what you yes, just yes, said. Yes. Okay, thank you. Right, right. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I think I took that from 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 other slides. Um, yes, it should be half, uh, or like the opening angle of the cone here is two delta. So um, that's why these integrals here um, basically always go from zero to delta and uh, high minus delta. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, are there other questions? Yeah. There's yeah. A question. <laughs> Yes. Hello. Um, how do you define uh, or find uh, a jet in case of a magnetic field which bend which bend the, the charged particle in different direction? So, since it's harder to find uh, the, the same opening angle. Can you speak louder? Can, can, can you can you oh, okay. understand? Okay. Uh, did you hear me well now? Yeah, yeah, yeah now no, should be better. Okay. Um, how do you define or find a jet in case of a magnetic field which bend the, the charged particle in different direction? In terms of what? He asked uh, if, uh... if you have a magnetic field, the charged particle which uh, uh, are bend in different direction. So how did you define a jet in this case? So Sorry, if, you have, I, if, you have, I, I if I understood correctly, uh -huh. if you are in a magnetic field, uh, so the particles are bent. No. And, uh, and so you want to know how you define a jet uh, in the case uh, you have bent particles, I think. Is it correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's my question. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, right. So it's like experimental, right? Yeah. So, so like the calculation, of course, I did with quark and gluon degrees of freedom, right? Um, so that's that's how I did the calculation, right? Now, how to do this experimentally, right? I mean. I think you just use the, the magnetic field right to to get it. What, what do you get from it? The the like the different properties, right? Like let's say like charge and energy and so on, right? But you just use that to reconstruct, you know, the properties of the particles, right? But then the jet reconstruction, of course, operates at the level of you know identified particles. Um, you, you know, it, you have its you know momentum, right? Maybe from a track reconstruction, right? And um, here we don't measure anything about the charge, right? So, um, like, or or like the particle nature, right? So the, the way right this algorithm works um, experimentally, <clears throat> right, is that like here this is sort of drawn really in terms of particles, right? Um, like I don't I, like this is completely ignorant to 
um, you know, what particle species I have or what the electric charge is, right? They're just grouped together sort of as a bunch of, of particles uh, together, right? Um, so you use, I think, the magnetic field to like reconstruct where the particles are, right? But then the jet algorithm operates on the actual, say, formant or whatever right, of, of the particles that you, I, you obtained, right, from like a, a magnetic field. Does that, does that answer the question? Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. thanks. There is also Ari. Question. Yeah, follow, following up on that, how do you decide what particle is in a jet? Because I would think that it's, you know, especially at TEV, there's kind of just lots of particles everywhere. So how do you, how do you draw a line and decide what's in the jet and what's out? So, so, it, so it, 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 TEV scales will not use this algorithm. Um, you, you could in E plus and minus collisions, but at the LHC, it's not going to work. Um, mostly, it's not going to work because you have QCD in the initial state, right? So you have like incoming photons, and they'll emit a lot of radiation, uh, very um, also very collinear to the beam, like not just in a transverse direction, but collinear to the beam. And then, um, you know, that's 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 sort of a problem here. But here you have a spherical um, symmetry. But the, the way you identify what's in the jet is really just this this algorithm, right? That that is shown here, right? Um, you basically just draw cones around it, um, and you check if these criteria are satisfied, right? And um, then you know you find a jet and whatever is in there um, that that's all the particles that are in the jet, right? So it's really like like um, algorithmically it's it's sort of very simple, right? Um, so I'll talk more about how exactly to do it for sort of the more standard algorithms that are used um, today, like the anti-KT algorhm and like issues with cone algorithms. I'll, I'll discuss those on the next slide, so that it may come a little bit more clear because um, that's what is actually used, um, you know, in, in experimental analysis today, uh, in particular at the LHC, right, if you have um, multiple TEV, um, then one has to sort of worry a lot more about that. Here is sort of a very, like, simplistic case, right, for E plus and minus co uh, collisions, where it's relatively easy to do a calculation, but it's it's not what is used um, in practice today. Um, yeah. Uh, can I add a comment here? Yes. Uh, so I understand that that like for high energy jets, like maybe the effect uh, due to magnetic field might be like very small. I think also Alec uh, commented on the chat. Uh, mostly, uh, isn't it that like, you know, due to like gluon radiation, like, you know, the bending or the energy loss of the jets occurs? The, sorry, say again? Uh, like due to the gluon radiation, the jets lose energy and like, you know, thus the bending of the, uh, jet trajectory happens, but usually like for a high energy jet, maybe the uh, magnetic effect is like very small. Is it correct? But, but it's, it's, it's two separate things, right? Like if, if you talk about energy loss, right, then it's usually really at the level of quarks and gluons, right? Then it depends on how I actually do the calculation, right? But the elect, like the bending in some, you know, detector, right? That that's right. These are like di different length scales, right? Like what happens in my detector is really at the particle level, right? I want to identify which particles there are to like get the momentum and stuff like that, right? But here, like the, the calculation I do in terms of quarks and gluons, right? Or if you talk about energy loss in terms of quarks and gluons, that's at much, much smaller distance scales, right? Like, so these, these problems are, are kind of separate, right? Like one is really like, how do I do the experimental, me the experimental measurement, right? And how do I do a calculation in terms of quarks and gluons, right? So that's, that's I would say, sort of two, two separate questions but i may not be able to you know perfectly answer the uh the question about the experiment and how the reconstruction of um jet works um especially not in in this particular case like i know that a little a little bit more about um how you do it you know at the lhc how you know you identify these like particle uh, it also depends on experimental collaboration right where you identify particle flow objects and then you need to you know apply all kinds of corrections and and, and uh, do unfolding and, and things like that right um but that's, that's, I would say, sort of a separate question of, of the particular calculation, right, that is done at quark gluon level, which is a much, much smaller distance scales than your detector, right? So these are really two separate uh, things. Right? Yeah, thanks. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great, thanks. Are there, are there, are there any other questions? No? Okay, okay, cool, cool. Um, Okay. All right. So yeah, I'll, I'll get to LHC jets in just a moment. I, I, I briefly want to mention something about the structure here um, that we found at next reading order of this calculation. So as I already mentioned, there's 
particular types of terms here. So this one here, that's kind of, or it, it could be the most important, right? So it, it sort of depends on what value we actually get choose for epsilon and delta, right? So if, if, if you notice, right, like when I, when I wrote down the algorithm from, from the Sturm and Weinberg jets, right? They have two parameters in there, right? They have epsilon and delta, and I didn't specify what these parameters are supposed to be, right? And you can imagine if I, you know, choose one value or one set of values, right? And I choose a different set of values, I'll get two different answers, right? Both in experiment, but also in theory, right? I get two different answers. And that already goes in the, in the direction, right? That there's no unique definition of a jet, right? There's something that I choose, right? I, in this case, I choose the, you know, the algorithm from, from, um, um, uh, from, from George and, and Steven Weinberg. Um, and I choose these parameters, right? But I could make a different choice, right? And so that, that's a really important aspect of jets, right? There's, there's no unique definition to say what it is, but there are definitions that I can you know, choose to my advantage that I want, right? In the end, what matters is that I can do a perturbative calculation and I can compare that one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to experimental measurements, but there's no unique answer to this. Um, but there are certain guiding principles and I'll, I'll cover those like infrared colonial safety and things like that, that tell us what's like a useful jet definition. So there's like some guidance from theory, but there will always be some sort of non-uniqueness in, uh, in you know, the way we set up um, jet calculations. And so one example we see here is both the algorithm and the choice of these parameters, epsilon and delta, right? For example, I could simply require that I make delta smaller, right? Then I require, then I only count jets as two jet events when they fit into like more narrow cones, right? That's maybe harder to satisfy as opposed to having like two large cones, right? So my cross section has to go down, up and down, right? Depending on that choice. And so you immediately see one issue here. Um, what happens if I now remove, or well, not remove, but if I if I take the limit of epsilon to zero or delta to zero, right? Then what I what I have, of course, is that these terms here diverge, right? It actually works for both. If I take epsilon to zero or I take delta to zero, <coughs> sorry, then what? Then this this cross section, um, you know, at some point doesn't make sense anymore, right? And so that gives like already an indication of what we potentially have to do, and which is that this computation here will eventually fail, right? If, I, if my delta is too small or my epsilon is too small, then this term here can be really, really large, right? And it can be so large so that even though alpha s is small, I mean, it's, it's still logarithmic, right? So it's not gigantic, right? I really have to make a very small um, choice for, for, for epsilon delta. But at some point, I'm of course in a regime where of s times these logs is like an order one quantity, right? And so this entire computation, right? And the comparison to, to experiment, which is you know, generally very successful, but it really depends on the fact that this, this is really a correction to one, right? So this term here has to be dominant and this has to be subleading, right? If this suddenly becomes an order one quantity and of the same order as this one, right? Then of course, I also have to worry about the next term that appears here in the perturbative um, series, right? That will be alpha S squared, but then, you know, it, it's, it has it, more logs, right? It will, for example, then contain logs to the power of four so that overall this entire thing is again on, on an order one quantity. And so in general, what you find is this kind of structure um, shown here um, on the right, where at every order in perturbation theory will, you know, get more um, powers than alpha S, but we'll also get more logs, right? And so if this quantity alpha S times log squared, where log squared, I basically mean this combination of logs in this particular case, if that becomes an order one quantity, then we basically have to account for all these terms here to all orders. Um, <clears throat> and so that is like, we'll refer to generally as all order resummation. Um, here, instead, we just do a fixed order per perturbative calculation, which works as long as epsilon delta are not too small, but if they become small, um, and of course, one has to check what it actually small means. Um, oops. Um, then one has to basically go beyond fixed order perturbation theory and do an all order resummation. And so I'm not going to do this here in this particular case, but we'll talk about that uh, in the context of a different algorithm. But it's definitely a, generally an issue that one has to worry about. In many cases, we cannot just do fixed order perturbation theory, but we have to worry about these logarithmic terms and we have to account um, for those to all orders.
Of course, if I basically now choose epsilon delta to be extremely small, then I basically just make a non conservative. Okay, so if I really choose it, you know, basically exactly zero or like close to zero, right, then it doesn't matter if I resum all the terms, then this thing will just be non perturbative. Okay, so there's there's different regimes. There's one regime where this fixed order perturb uh, perturbative result is sufficient. Then if I make epsilon delta smaller, I have to worry about these logarithmic terms. And if I take it too close to zero, then the entire thing will be non perturbative and this entire approach here, perturbative approach break, breaks down. Okay, so this is a one uh, first example, but it's really an issue of all perturbative QC calculations. Um, one can always um, uh, look at different regimes or one, you know, depending on the ex experimental situation, one has to look at uh, different, um, <clears throat> different things. Um, maybe one, one more comment. This is also very specific for an exclusive uh, jet algorithm. Later, we'll look at inclusive jet algorithms, which are more used um, at, at the LHC. In this case, we actually don't get this double logarithmic series, but we'll get a single logarithmic series. Um, in that case, there's not two additional logs for every power in alpha s. The higher orders, but it's just one. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about um, those uh, later. Okay, are there any questions about those things? This may be a little more technical, but we'll, we'll cover some, some more things in this direction um, that will maybe make it more clear. Okay, so one thing I still wanted to mention, <clears throat> and that's basically related again to this first term over here, this double logarithmic term, and that again, depending on the value of um, epsilon and delta can actually be the most important term. And so what we'd like to understand is where that's actually coming from, right? Can we identify what term in, uh, or what phase space region of um, this uh, glu emitted gluon actually generates uh, this term? Because as you can already see, right? If I take, if I remove um, these two parameters, epsilon and delta, if I take them to zero, right? Then I actually end up with singularities, right? If I then, um, like this, this, this thing here will just be singular, right? It will be divergent, but also every term, you know, of the virtual and real corrections will be divergent. So um, <clears throat> that's really an important um, component. So we should better understand where this term here is actually coming from. And so, as it turns out, it's coming from the region um, uh, what is referred to as a soft and collinear uh, limit. So what I'm trying to do here, or what I'm what, what I'm showing here, is what happens if uh, we take the soft limit and the collinear limit, um, then we have different contributions. And so I basically um, used um, this over here. We can approximate this for small delta, where right? that's the collinear limit, um, or you know, both directions eventually contribute. Um, but we're in the so-called soft and collinear limit. Then if we have two contributions, the first one is uh, integrating the energy from zero up to epsilon, right? Um, that's basically where we, um, but like that, that's something that can be anywhere, right? And then from epsilon to Q, um, epsilon Q to Q, that second contribution, that's where we specifically have to limit ourselves um, to uh, the injet region, right? Like here we have both, if epsilon is sufficiently small, we can be inside and outside the jet. Um, and in the other case, uh, we are basically here in this region um, where the, the gluon has to be specifically inside the jet that we um, allow the energy to be, to be larger. And so what you find is that um, in this case here, we have a virtual contribution and a real contribution, and they completely um, uh, cancel. Um, so that will be zero. So in this case, uh, we just get zero. So that's um, usually what happens. So, so virtual and real contribution, um, because we allow it to be anywhere. But now um, <clears throat> we basically get additional constraints, the virtual. So now, sorry, if the energy is now between epsilon or above epsilon, uh, then we have a virtual contribution here that it comes with a negative sign, and we have a real um, contribution um, that now requires the gluon to be between zero and delta, or between pi and you know pi minus delta. Uh, that just gives an overall factor of two. Um, and then you can see that this cancellation here doesn't work anymore. Right here, we just got an exact ca uh, uh, cancellation. Here, because these integrals are different, uh, the real and virtual um, don't cancel anymore. Um, and so we can then rewrite this here in the following form where we can just um, add these two integrals that gives an integral over delta, oh, sorry, over the integral over theta from delta up to one. And we get an overall minus sign because the virtual correction has a minus sign. And so um, in this case, right, this is basically what I would refer to as the soft and collinear limit. 
um, you can see that there are potential, or there could be divergences, right? If I take the limit of theta to zero and the limit of the energy of the gluon to zero, right? In that case, um, both of these terms or, or either of the terms would be um, divergent. And so what happens now is that we have these additional constraints, right? Epsilon and these additional parameters, epsilon and delta, and they basically make sure that, I, that I, these values here don't go to zero, right? Otherwise that um, integral here would be divergent, okay? And so um, now if we do the integrals here, where I said one over theta integrated from delta to one, that gives a log in delta. Here, this one will give a log in epsilon, right? And so the total cross section here, we can now write uh, like this in the soft component limit as one minus this expression over here. And well, these two terms here are like independent of each other, right? Both of them will give a log, one in epsilon, one in delta, right? And so we find that one, um, these two parameters are necessary, right, to regulate uh, the divergence and make sure that the final result for the cross section is actually finite. And it's the origin basically of this double logarithmic term, right? So this double logarithmic term that we see here in the cross section um, that basically originates from the limit where the additional um, gluon is softened and cold. Okay. And so that very often is like an important um, contribution uh, to the cross section where we then have to worry about these logs uh, to all orders. And that's something um, that you generally have in QCD. And that's actually um, the reason why we have jets in the first place, right? Like the, um, there's a diversion st structure um, in QCD, right? It's very likely that I'll emit say gluons um, that are very collinear, right? And um, <clears throat> that's because in the phase space here, I have a, an integral of a d, d theta over theta, right? Meaning it's very likely that I'll have an emission, my space an emission probability, where I have a lot of emissions when then um, theta becomes very small or close to zero, right? If I choose a correct algorithm, right, it will just give me a logarithmic contribution, right? So the divergence is cut off, but it's still enhanced. And that's actually the origin that we have jets like alpha s, you know, it's like a strongly coupled theory, um, or it's well, at, at low energies, but it's generally even in the perturbative regime of S relatively large, and we have an enhanced emission probability in um, the collinear direction, and that's basically the origin why QCD um, you know produces jets. Okay, and so we can basically see that here by looking specifically at the phase space of gluons, both in terms of energy and angle, and we find um, these these important double algorithmic terms um, for for this algorithm. Okay. Um, does that roughly make sense or are there any, any questions? Yeah, I don't see any questions. Okay. All right. Then um, <clears throat> let me show uh, a, a few more results um, from E plus E minus experiments. Um, so what you see here on the left is a um, uh, illustration of a three jet event from the Opal collaboration. Um, so we're basically looking here into the beam direction and what you see here are three jets coming out, right? That's something that would not satisfy um, uh, the, the Sturm and Weinberg um, jet criteria, right? Because we'll have these three jets and all of them carry almost um, the same amount of energy as you can sort of see from um, you know, the illustration of the, de of the detector. And so what they found is then that about 10% of the events have a third jet, right? And they basically come from these type of uh, 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 emissions in terms of the perturbative QCD language, right? Where I have an additional emission of a hard gluon um, that produces a third jet um, that I can then see here, right? And so generally it's 10% can also be understood because alpha S is more or less um, uh, 0.1, right? And so um, about 10% of the events have this additional jet um, that, um, that contains an additional gluon jet, and it's more or less consistent, you know, with with alpha s. And so, what we find here is that um, you know this, these actual events resemble um, this hard scattering process. Okay. Um, all right. So this was the first jet definition. Now, I still want to say before coming to you know what is typically used at the LHC now, I still want to give an example of how not to measure jets. Right. This this is. Um, Sort of historically, this has been very important because for a long time people used a, a algorithm uh, for jets that actually had um, some problems um, 
And so that's uh, known as a, a, a Kona algorithm that was you know, used before the LHC and then was later corrected um, um, in 2007. And so what is shown here, and that leads us then to infrared um, colonial safety, uh, is an example um, of a particular um, event configuration with three particles. So um, typically, right, we look at this in a plane. And so for simplicity, this is just a one-dimensional example. So what you see here um, on uh, the vertical um, coordinate is say the transverse momentum in terms of GEV. Um, and then you have here basically the um, uh, rapidity, or for now, we can just use the, the, um, the distance between particles. And so um, what you see here is um, basically how you can draw cones around these particles. Um, and so in this case, we, for example, find two jets, right? With this particular configuration, right, we draw two cones around it and we find two jets. Um, and so what we don't want to have, and that was used here for a long time, um, is that if there's a very soft particle in the event, then it shouldn't change the jets that we actually find. Right. And that's what's illustrated here on the right hand side. It's the same configuration plus an additional um, uh, very soft um, particle. And it turns out that can actually change um, the number of jets that we find in the event if I use um, the wrong algorithm. And so um, to make this a little bit um, more clear, I have like these two cartoons here. I hope you can kind of see it. So, so the way you can um, think of cone algorithms and, and sort of the, the problematic ones is that you take every particle as a seed um, where you draw a cone around it. So if you have say two particles that are at some distance d, um, then we draw a cone around it um, as shown here with a radius r. And so if the distance between these two is larger than two r, right, then I will identify those as two separate jets. Right, they'll draw a cone around it with radius r, and if you know two times r is larger than that, then they're sufficiently far um, away from each other um, that they will not be identified um, as a single jet. Right? Now, if the distance between these two particles is less than r, right, then even if I start with this configuration where I would like draw you know two cones around each particle individually, then I notice that there's actually two particles in each of the cones, and then what I should do is just draw a cone around both of them. Right? So that way, like if the distance between two particles is less than the radius of this, this, um, uh, uh, of this cone, then um, I'll basically end up with a single jet. And so <clears throat> there's now this um, configuration where we're, um, the distance between two particles is larger than r, but less than 2r. Um, so in this case, as you can see here, right, if I just draw a cone around one of them, um, then they can in principle overlap, but the cones, each of them will just contain a single particle. And so that basically happens if I choose as an initial seed to draw cones, I just take the initial particles that I have, right? So in this case, um, these, two, these two initial particles, okay? So in this case, um, I would call this two, um, two, two separate jets. But if I would basically not think about seeds at all, right, where I draw my cones, I would just, I, I could find, you know, a cone that contains both of them, right, because like the total diameter is 2R, right, and so if I, for example, have an initial seed here in the middle, I would just draw a cone around both of them. Um, and so that's, that's, that's sort of a, a problem, right, because then if I have a very soft particle, um, then it would basically change whether I find one jet or two jet, two jets, okay, and it turns out this um, way of um, finding out whether it was actually uh, infrared um, collinear unsafe. And um, what that means, and I'm not sure this was covered already, is, um, uh, sorry, this one, um, is uh, that we're very sensitive to very low energy uh, uh, momenta. Um, <clears throat> so ideally what I want is that my jet algorithm identifies this configuration here on the left, uh, with this one on the right. But if there's a very soft particle, say here in the middle, then um, I would not recover this, or then I should still recover this um, contribution here. But in some cases, um, if I choose the wrong algorithm, it wouldn't work. Um, so I'm not sure if this uh, concept of infrared colonial safety was covered already, um, but that's basically sort of the guiding principle um, to design um, jet algorithms 
and to design any kind of observable to make also sure that if we do a perturbative calculation, we don't end up with singularities. So if I would come up with an algorithm that is sensitive to very soft physics, then if I try to do a perturbative calculation, um, I would get um, singularities. And so that's not something uh, we want. Um, so let me skip a little bit to here uh, before uh, the end of the hour, just to at least have uh, the gen algorithms for the LHC uh, uh, today. Okay. You can go also. A bit, uh, can, I, can I still go a little bit? Yeah, because we lost 10 minutes at the beginning. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so if you have more questions about infrared coin safety, we can talk about it later. But I, I at least wanted to um, cover uh, the jet algorithms that we actually use at the LHC, at RIC, and uh, that we'll use at, uh, at the future uh, um, EIC as well. Okay, so um, here, what you can see here is an illustration um, of a particular event uh, that was recorded at the LHC. You can see here the detector, and there's a bunch of jets coming out, right? And, and as you can imagine, right, there's, there's definitely like a jet here, or there's a jet here, um, but we really have to make sure that we have an exact definition of what we want to call a jet. Okay? And so there's two variables um, that we need to describe that. I already mentioned that briefly before, where we have the azimuthal angle phi that goes around um, the beam axis, and then we have a polar angle theta, right? Um, that we typically write in terms of the rapidity, so minus the log of the tangent tan, tan, tan of, tan of um, theta over two, um, just so that it goes, um, uh, is, it makes it equally spaced, but also it, like that, um, it's now in the range between minus and plus infinity. And so what we then do um, is to just record the transverse momentum relative to the beam or the energy of all the particles um, in these so-called Lego plots that you can see on the right. right? So you basically unfold the cylinder um, and then you plot all the hits in the detector um, that you can see here uh, on the right, okay? And so now the goal is basically to find all the jets in that particular event configuration. Um, and you know, then we can measure the jets, we can measure the substructure and we wanna do a theory calculation, okay? So here on the vertical axis is the energy, right? And so it looks like there should be at least these two jets, maybe a third one here and a fourth one, um, but we need to have an exact definition, right? And so the definition that we typically use now is a so-called recursive um, clustering algorithm, or uh, specifically the anti-KT algorithm, was, which was developed in 2008 and is mostly used uh, these days. And so the way it works is <clears throat> that we um, recursively group particles uh, together. And um, the way it works is that we write down um, distances between particles um, that's shown here. So um, a distance between particles i and j is given by this expression here on the right, where here we just have the geometric distance in the eta phi plane. Right? So we basically just measure the distance between any pair of particles um, in, in the plane, and it, we divide it by um, the, what we'll later refer to as the jet radius, capital R. And then we also weight it here by one over um, kt squared of the particles. Okay, so here it's really just a geometric distance, right? Um, but then we weight it by one over kT, um, where, sorry, kT is where it's just the pT of the particle, so it's the energy. That means if I have a very soft particle, it gets associated a very long distance, right? And then what we basically do is we group particles together and we start with a pair of particles that has the smallest distance, okay? So we basically get a, whole, a long list uh, of distances, right? between all the different pairs, and then we find the smallest distance. And then we merge these two particles together. Yes, that's a question. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, could you go to the previous slide? Sorry, say, say again. Could you go to the previous slide? The previous one. Yes. Yeah, so uh, is so there's a, a image on the left, right, from the Atlas experiment. And then the graph on the right is, are they both from the same collision? Like? Oh, it's, 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 not, the same it's not the same event. It's not the same event. Okay, so yeah. I see that on the graph on the right, there are these two structures with really high energies with very close eta values, right? Yes. This would mean that there are two cones in the same uh, eta direction. There are uh, saying it. This would mean that there are two cones in the same rapidity direction. 
in the yes right 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 it's it's like similar rapidity that's right it's like rapidity is here so it's around minus two that's right so you would so there are two cones there are two cones in the minus two rapidity uh -huh. right okay okay Right, right, right. Thank I you. mean, this is just this is just one one particular example, right? So, so we'll we'll, we'll get to where exactly the jets are, right? Um, but this is just one particular you know event configuration that was generated here with Pythia eight with thirteen TV. It's it's not what's shown here. It's it's just you know random example. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay. So the way we now find these jets, right? We still need to draw you know cones here, right? Um, is through this recursive clustering. And I have another example that goes through this a little bit more detail in case this is, this is confusing. Um, but what again, what we have is a long list of pairwise distances, right? And we find the one that has the, the pair of particles that has the smallest distance, and we group those particles together. The way we group them together is we just add their four momenta into you know, a new uh, combined. Um, an object with a new form momentum, right? That's just the sum of the two four vectors. And then we remove the two particles that we merged from the total list and we add the new particle that was merged. Okay. So that's basic. And then we basically just iterate um, that proceed um, until all the particles are somehow merged together. Okay. So for example, um, like this, this one will associate soft particles a very long distance, right? Um, but if I have a hard particle, right, then it will start with that basically, right? Because say that gives an order one quantity. And so, for example, I merge, say, two particles together, and then I remove those two particles from the list, and I compute again all the pairwise distances now with that new merged particle, and I keep basically iterating that. Okay. <clears throat> and now we still need a way to actually stop that procedure, right? Because if I just you know merge all the particles together, right, then this entire event will be merged into a single jet. And that, that's not what we want. So what we need is a, a stopping procedure. And the stopping procedure is, um, uh, is uh, basically um, by adding additional distances, what are called beam distances. So for every particle to this entire list right, of distances, for which just have some numerical values, um, we add also um, for every single particle, the um, one over um, KT, so one over the energy of the particle, as an additional um, distance to the list. And once a um, beam distance is the smallest, right? If I have my entire list of distances, a, a beam distance is the smallest, then um, I will just call that a jet and I remove the entire thing um, from the list, right? And so the reason why this is done is basically gives us a nice stopping criteria because this is very, right? These two criteria are quite similar in terms of the prefactor. What's different though is the second factor here, right? So whenever the distance here in eta and phi is smaller than r, then this will always be like a smaller um, quantity than the beam distance, right? And so it basically makes sure that I keep clustering, right? I always find the smallest distance in my list is a pairwise um, a, a particle distance as opposed to a beam distance, right? I'll basically, you know, keep picking, you know, a, a, like a pairwise distance as opposed to the beam distance, um, and I'll keep merging particles together until these, there's nothing left basically, or until this prefactor here is larger than R. And then one of the beam distances is, um, is the smallest and I'll call that object a jet. Okay. And then, so let's, if we run this algorithm now on that particular event configuration, um, then we find this set of, I don't know, eight jets or something. Okay. So here we basically now been drawn cones around it, but the way we've drawn cones around it is through an iterative clustering procedure. Okay, and so as it turns out, this radius here, or what I introduced here as a, just a radius capital R, um, <clears throat> that is shown here. Um, so th this here, this R was chosen as one. Typically, it's chosen to be something a little bit smaller. Um, but here, for example, if you look at this, these are really kind of circular cones now with a radius R. And in this case, it's, it's about one, right? So you see the diameter here is about two and the radius is one, okay? And so using that um, particular procedure, um, it satisfies the criteria or it satisfies the criteria that we can calculate it or that we'll do later on. Uh, we can apply it here, we get circular um, uh, jets, even though we didn't you know, actually draw any like circular cone around it. Um, 
and it also does some kind of like splitting procedure, right? So for example, if these cones kind of overlap, then it basically associates the overlap area to the more energetic jet. So it makes sure that they first have everything and then you know, they sort of get something cut out a little bit, okay? Um, so that's generally like for this particular event, right? If we go back and forth, it's the same event. Um, and here, um, then we basically find all the jets where we require that the jets at least have a certain transverse momentum, right? Because otherwise I could just also draw jets here, right? And in principle, one can do that, right? Um, but then they will have very low transverse momentum in total, right? So we don't count those necessarily, okay? Um, so that's the standard procedure to identify jets. And so what I wanted to show here is a, um, uh, uh, an illustration um, that's coming from Gavin Salam, um, because I, that's the kind of the best way to, to illustrate um, this kind of iterative procedure. Um, and you know, I, I couldn't improve it anymore. So I'll, I'll just use his illustration over here. So um, this is done for a slightly different um, uh, algorithm. This is called the anti-KT algorithm where this prefactor has one over KT. And so what is used here is basically the inverse. So this is the minimum of KT as opposed to one over KT. But other than that, um, in terms of distance, it's really the same thing. And so what is shown here on the right is again, a, a one dimensional version of this just to illustrate it a little bit better, right? So you can think of this here, Y is a, a, the rapidity and we work say at, um, you know, phi equals zero, right? So for example, it's like a phi equals zero. So we basically just look at one particular slice here. Um, and so we just look at this as a one dimensional problem. Okay. And so um, the way, so, and okay. So here on the vertical axis, we have the transverse momentum of all the particles that are um, identified uh, in the event. And here we have the rapidity uh, or sort of the, the geometric distance, right? So in this case, this would then simplify, right? We'll just have basically um, only rapidity and the phi is here removed just for, just for simplicity. Okay, and now the goal is basically to find all the jets that are shown here. So what I basically did here on the, on the previous slide um, was to just show the, the full procedure right from here to here. Um, so it's a little uh, difficult to, to see how it actually happens. And so that's why here we can look at this what is step by step. Okay, all right. So this is say we have, I don't know, these around 10 particles. And so using this procedure now going through it step by step, we first find the pair of particles with the smallest distance, okay? And so in this case, um, it's this one, right? This is say shown here. The minimal distance of all the pairwise distances is in some numerical value, 1.2. And it turns out to be these two particles that are shown here in red, okay? So with this particular KT algorithm, right? This is the pair of particles that has the smallest distance. And so what we wanna do now in the next step is to group them together into one and remove the two red ones. Okay, so what we'll do is we add a green bar here that is now the sum of them, right? We just added the transverse momenta of the two uh, and we remove the original two ones from the list, right? So the two um, white ones are basically gone, right? They would group them together into one. So that's shown now here, okay? So that's the first step of the clustering procedure. And now we basically just iterate that, okay? So we find again, the next smallest distance that we have, right? And oops, here. So the next smallest distance of um, a pair of particles is shown here in red has 1.7, right? The previous one had 1.2. So this is the second one in the list. So now uh, we'll again, merge those two into the green one and remove the other two, right? Um, and then we'll continue. Um, now the next pair of particles are shown here on the right. Now has a distance 20. The reason it's like 20 and not, you know, say, I don't know, 0.5 or something is because of these prefactors, right? Here there's a KT in there. The KT is around 20 or something, right? So that, that distance here um, will, uh, and it's like 20 squared times a small number, right? So um, that, that's why this is the, the distance here. So this is now um, the next um, pair of particles that will merge and will become this. And then we find the next one. And so here it now finds these two particles that has the smallest distance. Right. Um, this now is already one that was merged, right? This is not an original particle anymore, right? This is something that was already merged from two, two particles um, uh, that we had at the beginning, but now they will be merged. And so while we keep doing that, uh, this is the next one, this is the next one, this, then the one on the right. Uh, so we have one very energetic one here now. Um, 
now we're just left with four um, four particles or, or protojets, you know, how, how you could call them, right? Like they're, they're not particles anymore, right? They're like combinations of particles. Um, and so the last one, uh, I think now that will merge is, is this pair, right? And so we'll have a very high energy jet, right? So this, this jet basically is a combination of all these things here on the map, right? With that particular clustering history, okay? Um, so we successively or iteratively merge particles together now we have here out of these relatively uh, out of these few relatively low energy uh, particles that we had at the beginning we created this you know relatively high energy jet that has 60 gb versus they here had around 10 or so right so we basically group all of them together and now we have these three left and um here like r is chosen as one so um the next one is actually a beam distance right so here before this was always you know the what what is uh, written here is dij, right? That's a pairwise distance, right? It's like this distance metric here, dij. Um, and now we find a beam distance, dib, right? So one of those is the smallest, right? That basically means this this one here, um, and it's ordered in kt, right? This is the smallest kt value out of the three. Like there's nothing anymore within distance r that I could cluster into that jet, right? Like these two are too far away, right? So I'm not going to combine these two anymore, right? Because of the particular value of R that is chosen. And so in this case, this is just a jet as it is. So we'll remove it from the list and that's one of the final jets that we'll have. So shown here in black. Um, then the next one uh, is this one. Um, that's the second most energetic one. And then the last one is, is this one, right? And so now we have three jets, okay? That, that's what we're left with. So this is this iterative procedure of, um, that basically gives us these three jets that we identify, okay? And so this is one sh shown here now in this you know, one dimensional um, way, but that's basically what is um, the underlying principle of when we go from here to here, okay? Except that now this is a two dimensional version and um, the other one was a one dimensional. Okay, are there any any questions? Yeah, I would, uh, yeah, there is a question, but uh, yeah, I would like to say that it's better to stop it after the other. Yeah, yeah, this is what anyway, the, the, the last okay. thing I wanted to say, okay. so. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. But if there are any questions about yes, this, yes, please, sure. Please, now please. we can open the, the discussion. So, Ari. Yeah. Um, sorry, I think I, I missed this. But how did you decide to when to stop um, looking at the distance between jets and start looking at the distance to the beam? How did you know to stop at three? Oh, so so it's um, it, it's it's because of this, right? I mean, you always look at all of them, right? Like you have a, like a gigantic list that in, includes both pairwise distances and beam distances, right? And so it, it just so happened, right, that at some point, um, like a beam distance is the smallest, right? And that's because this has this additional factor here, right? Um, and whenever um, basically this, so w w whenever this becomes larger than one, right? Then if you compare it to this, right? Then something like this will be, then the beam distance will be the smallest, right? But whenever the distance here um, you know, in, in rapidity and phi is smaller than R, right? Then this is a, a quantity that's less than one, making that distance to be very small. And then that will actually be picked first, right? And only when that quantity is larger than R, then that will be uh, picked, right? And that's basically what happened here. So here in, in this particular uh, illustration, right? Like at this point, right? Um, <clears throat> the distance here, so I think R is chosen here as one, right? And then, um, these, this one here is too far away, right? Um, and then the, the pairwise distance here is actually larger than the beam distance, right? And so that's, it's because of, because of this ratio, right? Whenever this ratio is um, sufficiently small, they will be clustered together. Um, and if it's too large, then the, it will not continue, right? And then it will just isolate them and, and, call, and then you call that object a jet. Does that, that make sense? Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Like uh, nobody is other question. So let's thank uh, oh my god, Felix uh, for the lectures of today. So I thank they are thanking you, tuning to you. Uh, if you open the chat, you can see that. And uh, so thank you very much. And uh, we we are reconvene with Felix uh, tomorrow morning, I think.